Cooler School is brought to you by Odyssey Games, where you can go to get singles for all your Force of Will and other trading card games, as well as these amazing patrons. Thank you for your support. Enjoy the video. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Tournament Report with yours truly, Paul Reisman. And today we are going to be looking at the season of autumn and all of the tournaments for Force of Will that happened during the time of September all the way up until, well, now, a couple days right before the World's Tournament. So keep in mind, yeah, you're going to be wanting to watch this uh, with an anticipation of what we're going to be seeing at the World's Tournament in just a couple of days. Uh, so without further ado, we're just going to get right into it. And if you are looking for any of the deck lists, links as always are in the description down below. So the first tournament we're going to be looking at is GP Hong Kong. Uh, this is something that happened right after we made the initial uh, summer roundup video last time. And the winner of that tournament was a Loki deck. A uh, perfect Loki deck specifically. Now, if you need to pause the video and take a look at this list, there's a lot of different things going on in here. Some of these cards might be familiar to you. Things like Look of Corruption, Erendite, the Nitrogen Blade. Uh, of course, the Altar. That's something we've been talking about a lot. Uh, but we're going to get into some of the new cards that have been released after Decisive Battle of Valhalla. So, Loki as a new deck right now. Uh, Loki has not been seeing a lot of play up until now, and mostly that's because they didn't have uh, Perfect Loki. Now, Perfect Loki is incredibly important. It has quick cast, and when you put it onto the field, it gives your opponent minus 100 for every card in your graveyard on the back end. So, uh, imagine that you have a Resonator with 10 defense. Uh, Loki's going to come in if you have 10 cards in your graveyard or more, it'll do minus 10 to their defense. And that's a cloud effect, which applies to the entire field. So if someone wants to quick cast something in on their side of the field, it will die as well. So just keep that in mind as well. Perfect Loki is a very, very, very good card right now. And it's quick cast. Um, it's like final battle, but better. Um, but the most important part, I would think, for a Loki deck is that you get all of that if you cast it as a resonator. But... You get to reveal Perfect Loki from your hand and place it on top of uh, your Loki, J Ruler, and uh, transform it into this card. And what the most important part of this does is it gives that Loki Imperishable, Divinity, Infinity, and then an Enter effect that says, look at the top 10 cards of your deck, put one from among them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard, and once per turn you may play a card from your graveyard. So it essentially allows you to uh, replay things from your graveyard as if you were playing something like Necronomicon. But you might be wondering uh, what the Divinity Infinity has to do. Well, essentially it allows you to play Neo Ragnarok. And Neo Ragnarok is a really good win condition for this deck because it only costs two and you just slot it into your rune deck essentially. Uh, if it's in your deck, which it never should be, it's gonna cost nine. So I would suggest if you're playing Loki to play this in your rune deck. And that way you get to slam uh, five huge resonators with really powerful effects onto the field uh, as well as have a really good J ruler that you really can't kill very easily because it has imperishable. So the other things we need to talk about with this uh, perfect Loki deck are uh, the the small one drops that add something to this as well. Uh, the Fallen Angel of Fiery Vengeance in pretty much any black list is probably honestly probably the best mana changer mana dork whatever you want to call them in this situation it's probably the best one because not only does it get rid of all of the other uh, mana dorks on your opponent's side of the field by giving them minus four you can pay 200 life to uh to do that from your graveyard and that is incredibly important for uh, another reason that we'll be talking later in the video but paying life in this meta is something that is actually very relevant but of course, none of these things would be able to, to happen in quite the same way if we didn't have Sacrificial Altar. Yes, that is right. Sacrificial Altar is still very, very, very good, and it should be. Uh, you just banish a Resonator. Not once per turn, not only on your turn, banish a Resonator. So you can pretty much suck up all of your Resonators that are going to die and just throw them into the Altar. And then you can banish this card. And you search your deck for a Resonator with total cost X or less to the number of counters that are on the card, and you just put it into the field at instant speed. And then you shuffle your deck, which is really nice, because now you know that any of the cards that you mulliganed are now back in the deck and are fair game. 
So Sacrificial Altar has always been really good with Lila, who goes to the graveyard and gives you a Darkness Magic Stone. And uh, that just allows you to ramp. And because Sacrificial Altar is pretty much unhinged, you can use it as many times as you want, you can use things like March of the Dead to bring back this Lila and do a lot of crazy things. And because we have Sacrificial Altar, that can just pop out Resonators, not even Darkness Resonators, Resonators. You can play things like Dark Alice, Rabbit Princess fairly easily to protect your graveyard, to draw some cards, and uh, if you're playing this you're probably playing it uh, for one of the two effects, right? You're probably playing it to protect your graveyard, draw cards, or you're playing it for all of the effects to get uh, access to perfect mana. The next card that's really making a splash in this deck is Athenia, Deity of the Harvest and Corruption. Uh, Athenia is just really, really good. And if you can bring this out um, with Altar at the right time, you can pretty much lock your opponent out from playing the game. And it basically turns into a Law of Silence, or um, it turns into, I mean, a Distortion of Time, kind of, um, because it can just shut down your opponent's uh, everything and recover your stones and do all these crazy things that um, is a Resonator is probably one of the most powerful we have in the game right now. So just keep that in mind. And of course we have Athenia's Love as well, which is really good to have because it can give um, anything you want. It can give it Eternal, or um, if you have Athenia, you can choose both and your opponent just, just has to um, banish a Resonator, which is completely and utterly relevant. And if you're worried about getting that green, well don't worry because you can just pay a few life and get your Mana Transmuter online and create that green in order to uh, to get to Athenia. No problem whatsoever. And of course, Mana Transmuter, free drop, not that hard to get in terms of altars, so um, Mana Transmuter, super easy to get. And this is something that we're going to be seeing with Loki decks going forward. Loki is probably going to be more into black than it is going to be into blue because there's so many good black cards in the game right now. And frankly, it's probably, probably the best color in the game right now and of course we mentioned this on stream during the force of will festival for bite ramen over here in michigan and uh we had some interesting some interesting conversation around that so let me know in the comment section down below what do you think is the best color in force of will right now i would definitely hedge my bets on black being the best color but we're going to keep moving through uh gp hong kong and we're going to look at second place now and that is isis so isis got a lot of really nice and uh, new toys, one of them being Yarlathotep, God Devouring Messiah. Lots of interesting words there. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Of course, she has an awakening effect. Yarlathotep is known for her awakenings, and if you uh, pay X, and so that's any amount of will that you want, you can put X amount of fire, moon, addition tokens into the field, and then she has additional effects based on the number of moons that you want to sacrifice. Um, and if you control the moon edition, she gets precision and uh, swiftness, which is very relevant because she's a 10 cost. Uh, that's really, really, really good. Um, and there are ways to give things eternal in this game. Although, uh, for the most part, you don't really need them with her. You can just give her eternal if you need to be. Um, prevent the rest of the damage that we do down to this card for this turn so she doesn't necessarily have eternal but it's kind of like that so you can just ram into something by banishing a moon edition and then she can just do whatever she needs to do Nyarlathotep is a very good card and she is a two drop very 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 good and she gets better with Isis so if you generate a bunch of moons with Nyarlathotep or with any of the other cards that we're going to be looking at today um, Isis can just make those into additional mana for you they just produce more will they produce either uh, fire or light will, which is very, very nice. And of course, if you don't have that Nyarlathotep on the field quite yet, and you need something uh, to get your engine going, well, Isis will just search her right out of the deck for you. Uh, and she's a really solid 3-drop, an 8-8 3-drop with First Strike and Bane and this Enter effect and this will production effect. So she's going to be something you want to protect uh, for sure in this in this game of course we have other moon producers in the game we have a uh, surter who is not only a really good way of getting rid of stuff on your opponent's side of the field but it also has natural swiftness so if you need to hard cast it which you could definitely do uh with all those moons if you need to hard cast this thing it comes in gets the enter effect and it has swiftness 
and you can't kill it with something like Life Severing Blade. So just keep that in mind. Surtur is very, very good, as most of the giants are very good. I would say Surtur is definitely in the top three. Um, so having this naturally in your color is really nice. And of course, if you have it in your hand, you just discard it for three, uh, two of those being red, of course, and you do the exact same effect. Uh, and you produce Moon Token, which is really nice. Nyarlathotep, Isis, Surtur, uh, all of these love having additional Moon Tokens. So the other mana dork we need to be talking about today is Desert Miner. So all of your Fire Magic Stones are now Light Magic Stones as well. So they're essentially um, Magic Stone of Heat Ray. And then if you need to, to get this card out of the way, if you need to banish it, you can to put a, a Fire Moon Edition token into the field, effectively ramping you in a sense uh, if you end up getting that Isis onto the field. So Desert Miner is very, very, very good. Um, it also dodges that Fiery Angel of Vengeance pretty well, and also forwards your win condition, which is really nice. But then you also have things like Godly Aura to do damage to uh, anything you need on the field. Draw a card, uh, you can put a Moon Edition token into the field. Um, it's basically uh, like a mini Surter, but on a Chant Rune. It's only one cost, and it's quick cast. This card is amazing. Uh, I think it's a very good rare. So if you have the if you have access to three or four of these, definitely use them in this deck. Uh, this card is fantastic. And so you can see, just basically by the cards that we have in the deck itself, uh, Isis wants to go very, very, very fast. So if you're new to the game and you're like, well, how do I play Isis? Uh, just take a look at uh, this deck list. Um, and just notice that there are a ton of things going on in this deck. Most of them we've already shown off, but of course we have Shu and Ushua, which we can look at a little bit later, and just means of protecting yourself in, the, in that situation. You have Spiral of Chaos in your rune deck to get rid of things on the field if you need to. So Isis has a lot going on for it, and it's very, very good for that particular reason. So what's next? Well, I'm excited to say that third place was Machines. Uh, Arthur Machines is super fun to look at uh, because there are so many new cards in it. But you also recognize that there are a ton of cards in here that have been here from the start. And of course, if you're looking at these lists and you're like, well, why is anyone running Keys' Call? I should mention at this point, probably, this whole tournament was cluster only. Um, so some of these cards are only available in new Valhalla format, so you're only going to be playing those. And this deck is very efficient at using the tools that it has, including Nitrogen Blade um, and some other cards, including Merlin, which has not seen a lot of play, but so this might um, slow down just a little bit later into the game uh, using that Merlin to, to bring out whatever you need, including, uh, of course, probably the most important resonator of the deck right now, Deus Ex Machina. So when this card enters the field, remove any number of counters from entities you control. And this card gain, uh, enters the field with plus one and plus one counters on it equal to twice the number of counters removed. So you essentially um, will play something like uh, Clockwork Girl or even the, the, new, um, the new Arthur, which we'll take a look at in just a second. You'll play Clockwork Girl suck up all of her plus one plus one counters and she'll effectively die but deus ex machina will come in with um eight of those counters essentially now i'm not saying you want to do that not necessarily that would not be the smartest thing to do because uh, then you just lose a resonator uh but of course if the card is put into the graveyard you look you get to look at the top card of your deck and if it's a machine you get to add it to your hand so it may not be the worst thing but you probably still don't want to do it you want to keep as many machines on the field as possible uh, and Deus Ex also says that there are 10 or more plus one plus one counters on this card. It gains flying, eternal, and then you can remove plus one plus one counters from uh, from this card and put a plus one plus one counter or a counter with a name of your choice on another target entity you control. So Deus Ex Machina is the counter master. And he looks a lot like, I don't know, uh, Machina from Alice Cluster. I just find that really, really interesting. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. So one of the cards you may want to target with Deus Ex Machina is Machine Core, because it enters the field with five plus one plus one counters on it. Um, and you can, of course, add directive counters to, to it using Deus Ex Machina if you need to. Um, but Machine Core is a really good target for this. That's why there's a couple in this Hong Kong list. So an ideal uh, turn one play might be 
Uh, play Clockwork Girl. Get your plus four, plus four counters. Play something like Machine Core, or even the new Arthur. Machine Core comes in with five, plus one, plus one counters. Arthur comes in with six, plus Barrier, which is really nice. And those, uh, those effects, uh, the effect to sort of re-up your plus one, plus one counters occur if your ruler is Arthur, which indeed it is. So this is the ideal turn two play. And then you play something like Lancelot. So at this point, Clockwork Girl and Arthur have enough counters for Lancelot to be very, very effective. Lancelot comes in, if this is your only board state, of course you're going to have 13 counters, and you haven't even used your maintenance yet. So the, the ability to essentially place everything on the field that you need, and then have Lancelot be able to secure the board, you have to get rid of Lancelot or you just straight up lose the game. That's really powerful, and that's why machines are going to be doing, I would say, pretty darn well. I think the most important thing to recognize in these cluster only tournaments, and the reason I'm covering them, is that these are the decks that we are going to have at full power uh, going into the, the new format, the new New Frontiers format with Alice Origins. And from the spoilers we've seen so far, those decks are pretty self-contained and there's not a lot of trading between um, the different archetypes that we're seeing. So just keep in mind, machines are gonna be very powerful going into the next format, as well as Loki and Isis. And speaking of Isis, uh, here's another Isis list that cracked the top four. And of course there are a few other uh, technical choices, but you're gonna notice here that there are four Shu, four Desert Miner, four Isis, four Surter, four Nyarlathotep, three of the uh, the older Nyarlathotep, which I think is really interesting. It came out of the third set, Awakening of the Ancients. Uh, I find that very interesting. And of course, Godly Aura and a few other cards that just help to either protect or remove things from the field. And they're playing Spiral of Chaos in their rune deck as well, as, as opposed to uh, Conflagration, which is the other master rune Isis has to her name. So congratulations to all these players who made it into the top four at GP Hong Kong back in September. Of course, uh, they're going to be at Worlds. If you got the invite, you're going to be at Worlds. So congratulations to the winner of this tournament. Next up, we have GP uh, Nima. And I had to figure out how to pronounce that correctly so I don't get a bunch of uh, crazy comments in the comment section down below. But Nima, GP Nima, also happened in September. And uh, we don't have a ton of ruler breakdown for this, but we do... I'm sorry, we don't have a ton of lists for this, but we do have the ruler breakdown. So we have 11 Hanzo, Isis, and Loki, as well as 7 Brunhild and 6 Adam, 3 each of Arthur and Lucifer, 2 each of Chimimi and Lich, and then the one hero running Fushi. Shoutouts to the Fushi player. Gotta have dragons. And of course, this is also going to be a cluster-only tournament based on the breakdown of the rulers here. And uh, the winner was Lars Grams. So congratulations to Lars. Uh, he's really good at playing Ayu, but because you can't play Ayu, you might as well be playing Hanzo. Um, and you're going to be seeing Hanzo later, a little bit later in the video as well. Hanzo is one of these rulers that you really need to take a look at um, because Hanzo, um, even though he's the master of not all of the arts, but somewhat good at some of the arts, he definitely seems like he's the master of all of the arts because he's able to flow in between all these different colors, but that's neither here nor there. And as you can see, we're playing Altar. And Altar is really great because you get to use Lila with it and you get Mana Transmuter and all these other fun cards, uh, March of the Dead, Dark Alice, Fire Angel of Vengeance. But then because of the way that the, this deck in particular works, you get to play things like Kaguya. So even though she's not in your color technically, because you're running pretty much only black stones, uh, even though she's not in your color necessarily, uh, she is able to be run because of the way this deck works with things like Mana Transmuter and uh, the way you're just kind of cycling through your deck so quickly uh, with things like Lila, you're able to kind of get the the one of stones in your uh, in your stone deck that you can't fetch with Lila. So you're 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 basically just thinning out your stone deck very very quickly. So you're able to uh, essentially get two or three stones a turn, which is absolutely ridiculous. But we also need to look at the fact that yep, we have Fiery Angel of Vengeance and Mana Transmuter, so we might as well be running a stand. 
So Stan is very, very good, and uh, his, his effects is super, super, super long. Um, but essentially, he just comes in, uh, and he either wipes the board or revives your board, uh, depending on what mode you want to do. And in order to get counters on him, in order to do that, you need to pay life. Um, and every time you do pay life, you get more counters on him. Stan is very good. I think he's very good at a one or a two of. If you don't have multiples of this, if you only have about one or two of these, that is all you really need. I don't see you hard casting this very often because you want him to be removed from the game in order uh, for his stuff to actually take place. And if you're using things like uh, Invitation to Purgatory to sort of dump your stuff into the graveyard to get yourself going, uh, Stan is very easily searched out and you can pay whatever you need to put him in your exiled place. So he's very, very good. And of course, like I said, you have Fiery Angel of Vengeance to not only remove your opponent's dorks and disrupt their stone base, you also have the ability to pay life later in the game uh, for that effect to use Stan's uh, most powerful effect. Uh, that is getting all of those Fallen Angel counters on him, which is very, very good. And then Protect Your Graveyard, you're obviously playing Dark Alice as well. And this is also to help you to search through your deck and dump things into the graveyard as much as you need. And uh, it's really nice to bring it back with March of the Dead as well. That's a thing you need to recognize as, uh, as well. And I just want to say congratulations to Lars. He's a great guy. We've had conversations over Facebook. Um, so I'm really glad that he's going to be going to Japan and experiencing the fun of the world's tournament. So congratulations again to Lars for winning GP Nima. All right, and next up we have uh, the Uber series for Force of Will that happened in Madrid. And we do have a ruler breakdown for that as well. So we're going to be seeing about 12 Lokis, 7 Arthurs, 5 Isis, 4 Brunhild, 4 Adam, and then the 1 Fushi. Who is this 1 Fushi? I don't know who they are, but they, in my opinion, are the champion of this whole tournament. I think Fushi is going to get some love with some of the new cards that we're seeing in the next set, but we'll hold that to the thoughts section, but shout out to the Fushi player. I think that's awesome. So one more thing we got to recognize about the Uber series in Madrid is that there is no um, no altar. There's no altar at all. There's also no Lila. No power of immortality, which I thought was really interesting. And there's also no ceiling scroll. So basically, uh, there's really no reason to run Hanzo unless you want to run Table Flip. And Table Flip is not that great. So this is your ban list for the Uber series in Madrid. So first up, we're going to be seeing the, the deck that won, and that was Brunhild. Yeah, Brunhild won. Um, I think that's very interesting to see that Brunhild has it uh, to actually win this. And congratulations to Alex Duvall for actually piling this deck to the top. He was one of those four Brunhilds that actually made it into the top cut. And then uh, his opponent in the top two was was another Brunhild list. It was exactly the same as this one, so I'm pretty sure they know one another and have tested it at least. Um, so they were piloting the exact same deck. Uh, you're going to be noticing in the rune deck that Odin's Judgment is being used. And I think that's a good call because we do not have a uh, ceiling scroll to stop this from going off and blowing up the field. It's a low divinity cost. It's a relatively low uh, mana cost, frankly. I mean, three stones is not much to pay for the entire board getting wiped, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, but there's some other cards that we're seeing in here too. It's mostly a white deck, but it has just enough green in it to make use of some very prominent and very powerful cards. One of them, in my opinion, is Bastet. Now Bastet is a card that we have not seen a ton of, at least in New Frontiers quite yet, but I think it is something you want to look at. So it's one of the super rares from our last set, the DBV set. And it comes in and it returns a target non-Magic Stone, non j Roller entity. So any addition, any any resonator that you have, um, or in, in future instances, Regalia potentially as well. You, know, you drop a Bastet, you put something back into your hand. Other Cat J Resonators gain plus two, plus two. That's largely irrelevant. Um, and then you can banish a Magic Stone and target J Resonator you control gains barrier until end of turn, which I think is relevant, especially since we're running Kaguya in the deck. So keep that in mind. You can get rid of Magic Stones using this card, and it's a one drop, so it's very easy to just, you know, plop into the field. I suppose the plus two plus two is relevant if you want to pump up your Calico Cat, um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but Calico Cat is very good. 
um, because it can alter some of the cards in your opponent's graveyard if they happen to not have uh, their Dark Alice on board. Um, so I think Calico Cat is very good in this deck because it gives you some sort of grave disruption, which is really nice. We also have a couple copies of True, the Giant of Destruction, the Johnny Green Johnny himself. He's able to come in, and if you want to hard cast him, uh, he's good for infinite blocks, but he's also good to sort of uh, tutor out any of the one drops you need from your deck. So Calico Cat, Algernon, Dark Alice, Bastet. You can bring any of those out of the deck and right into your hand and ramp yourself a stone, which is really nice. All for three will. And then, of course, if he is on the field, he's going to be really, really, really hard to get rid of. So there you go. He's a late game option for you as well. And then, of course, we have a Chant of Tranquility to sort of mess with your graveyard and put anything back in that you need uh, in order to meet the Haiku standards for Kafia. Sealed God of the Moon. Probably one of the better cards of the entire set. Next to um, probably Perfect Loki and Dark Alice, this is probably... Um, in my top three for this entire set. Kaugia is just very good. She's the only other cancel spell that we really have outside of Sealing Scroll and this next card, the Song of the Fairies. Now this is just a generic one divinity, never gonna play in your rune deck because why pay four for anything? I mean, you might, but you probably will never want to do that. Um, but it just cancels the target spell. It's like a seed magic from uh, way back in Grim Cluster. It's just a Pay three, cancel whatever you want. It's kind of like, uh, oh gosh, Seal of Wind and Light as well, except it's a little bit more costly, and it's just in green. So I think this is probably the only cancel spell we're going to be seeing in the game outside of Kaguya. And you notice that uh, if they're wanting to play just even a couple of these, uh, it really takes a cost on the deck. You're going to be wanting to play Kaguya much more, and uh, she's kind of color locked a little bit. Now, there are decks out there that can obviously run her outside of those colors, but it's a thing next up we're gonna be taking a look at GP Osberg at least I hope it's Osberg um, some of the scans that I saw for this uh, just had GP a U S and I'm just assuming that this you know be this is in Europe and this is in Osberg Germany I'm just assuming because this is also uh, very 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 cluster it's not it's not uh, new frontiers whatsoever but Nicholas whoever Nicholas is congratulations for winning and this is your standard Isis list um, that's using Conflagration instead of um, Spiral. But I think it's also interesting that we're seeing a couple of Brunhild Shield, which can give uh, Eternal to any Resonator you want by banishing it uh, until end of the turn, which is kind of nice to protect your uh, to protect your Isis, your Isis Resonator, or your Neralithotep Resonator. Or your Surter. I don't know why you would ever need to do your Surter, because it already has Barrier, but if you need to, it's there or even uh, your Anubis as well. Like This card is very good for just protecting your stuff, which is kind of needed. And I imagine that's the reason for Country of the Sun Minerva to protect resonators on your turn from being destroyed. Um, so I think this is just another alternative um, path to take for things like Isis, uh, who's already pretty, pretty comfortably in white to some degree. Uh, because of Desert Miner. And it's going to be more so because we're getting Heat Ray. Um, so Ice is going to have a lot more consistency here coming up pretty quick. And you can run things like Brunhild Shield. I think that's got pretty pretty smart move. You continually find your Isis being killed. So congratulations to Nicholas for winning GP Osberg. And next up we're going to be talking about the Vite Ramen Fowl Festival uh, here that we had in Michigan. And for all of you who tuned in on stream... Uh, this is just a picture of me doing that that awesome job with uh, my friend Joe Carell from the time that we were both in uh, Team Memoria until now. Uh, looking at all of these spoilers coming up for Alice Cluster, we've we've been in the game together for a while, and we just got back together uh, at this festival. Since he's on the other side of the state now, it's it's a really good time to just. Uh, get together, play Force of Will, and just to commentate and, and notice these fun interactions. So if you were on stream with us, you recognize that we were plugging Vite Ramen really heavily, and Vite Ramen even got in on the fun a little bit. It was a really, really, really good time, and I'm really glad if you were there on stream, uh, you made the event for me, and uh, the games were fun, uh, the interactions, the giveaways, the Vite Ramen <laughs> itself. 
all of it was just very, very cool. One of the best times I've had in Force of Will in a very, very long time. Uh, so yeah, we're we're definitely looking into potential next year's stuff already, and uh, that's all I can let you know about right now. That's all the information I have. But that aside, we should probably actually get into the deck list from uh, winner of the Foul Festival, Stephen Holshizer, who was running a well. Uh, I don't know who Stu is, but they said he can play five colors, which is really great. Uh, ultimately, this is just another black Hanzo list. Um, Steven would say that it's really more of a five color list, but it's pretty evident here that there is a really heavy bias toward black in terms of deck construction. So you have some cards that are not in black, like Dark Alice, of course. Uh, Perfect Loki is a little less in black because uh, you have to have blue in order to play him, but he's there. And of course, we have Kaguya and uh, Athenia as well. And then the one of Lorite, which is really great. And then, of course, a couple of Zeus Alex, uh, Zeus Alex's, wow, Zeus Alice's in the sideboard, um, which are really, really awesome resonators that I don't feel like I've talked about nearly enough in this video. And that makes me sad. But Ze uh, Zeus Alice is really cool to watch on stream. That's all I'm going to say. And of course, in the list here, you can see right next to the Stan uh, in the middle of the stack there, we have. For uh, Forbidden Fruit. Heavenly Fruit. I call it Forbidden Fruit all the time because it makes you discard your hand and kind of makes more sense flavor text-wise, but Heavenly Fruit. This is one of those cards that was really meant for uh, Scarlet decks when they first came out in Time Spinning Witch. Um, but what this essentially does is it says you have to discard your hand and then you can play Resonators from your graveyard until uh, the end of the turn. And if a card would be put into your graveyard from anywhere, it is removed from the game instead. Sounds a lot like the Necronomicon card way back from Grim Cluster. I completely agree with you, person on the other side of the screen. But Heavenly Fruit is a really good tech in this deck, because all of a sudden you can just flood the field with your Lilas, flood the field with your Dark Alices, flood the field with uh, whatever else you need, including um, your Mana Transmuters, um, your Athenias, your Kakuyas, especially Kaguya and Perfect Loki who have Quick Cast. Dark Alice also has Quick Cast, which is really nice. Uh, and then if you have uh, used up Lorite in the graveyard, you can use that as well. It's really, really, really cool. I think this is a good tech, and it just allows you to reuse and recycle all of that fun stuff. And to continue on that theme, we have uh, a playset, a three of playset of Command of Life and Death to bring stuff back. Three costs or less from the graveyard. Hey, would you look at that? Everything except for Stan is three drop or lower. Which is really, really nice. Uh, this card is something that I, I really liked when it was first printed, but because of the state of the game and how much removal of the graveyard there was, and there was no protection for the graveyard, it didn't see a lot of play. But at the very end of this new Frontier cycle that we have, uh, we're seeing it get some play, which I think is really, really great. Um, I think this card is actually decent, and it's underrated. Um, and for all of you who are interested in this card for Wanderer, uh, yeah, this card is really good for Wanderer. Because uh, there's a lot of recursion that that happens in Wanderer, so keep your eyes peeled for this card in that in that setup. But then, of course, we have March of the Dead, which is just like that card, but a little bit cheaper. You pay one, and you can bring anything two cost or less from your graveyard and put it into the field. And if you want to bring up two, you just have to pay two more will to make it happen. It's really great. But of course, to get all of this running, to get all of this going, you notice there's going to be 44 total cards in this entire list, but. It's really more like uh, 34 before you draw because of harvesting season. So you're going to draw your cards, you're going to do your mulligans, and then you're going to be at, say, 39 cards, and all of a sudden you're going to be down to 29 because of harvesting season. You pay one, and you mill the top 10 cards of your deck into your graveyard, and you get to go ballistic. This deck was super fun to watch. If you want to view the stream, it's back on the archive of the channel. It's 11 hours, but if you want to catch this particular matchup uh, with Steven's list, uh, there was a lot of that in the final uh, in the final eight rounds. So, the final eight rounds, excuse me, the top eight rounds. That is so incorrect. I don't even know what to do with it. But here you go. Um, Harvesting season with Ceiling Scroll and all the other good stuff in the deck. Uh, this is awesome. This is one of the reason I, reasons I think that black is probably the best color in Force of Will right now, just because of how influential and how um, just kind of explosive this color has been uh, developing into over the course of the entire New Frontiers format so far. All right, next up, 
we have uh, Paul Ludwig's other Hanzo list. This got third place, but it's a little bit of a different take. So the most important thing you're going to want to notice here are the differences in cards, specifically Ushua and a heroic epic for the Thousandth Knight. Uh, so Ushua, we're just going to back up a little bit. Ushua says that when he enters the field, you look at the top five cards of your deck, and you put a resonator that's five cost or less into the field, and the rest on the bottom of your deck in any order, so nothing goes to the graveyard, which is kind of nice. But essentially you get a free plop anything you want into the field. And lo and behold, everything except for Ushua is five drop or less. And you're probably going to be wanting to spam this person, uh, this person, this guy, this samurai, this uh, warrior person with a heroic epic for the Thousandth Knight. Put any resonator you want into the field. And then at the end, next end of turn, return that card to its owner's hand. Uh, Ushua is very, very good at that. In Wanderer format, you can blink Ushua out and it stay, and it will come back into the field instead of going back to your hand, which is really nice. And then he'll always be there. You get to reuse the effect. All of these fun things happen. And then the bonus is the fire resonators you control uh, get swiftness, which is nice because you know Ushua himself will get swiftness, and he's a 1700 body. That's huge. Um, and ridiculous. And if you end up grabbing, uh, say, an Athena off the top of your deck, all of a sudden your opponent's stuff is completely rested. You're probably playing Freed from the Altar to grab something beforehand, like your Lila, so you're probably going to get that Rune 1 effect off. You're able to harvest and corrupt without any real issue at all. Rest your opponent's board. Uh, recover a few of your stones, do some crazy stuff, remove all cards from your opponent's graveyard from the game, why not? Um, this Athenia is very good. And the other Athenia is also really good, and it happens to be a 5-drop, so you can just land this Athenia, and your opponent has to do a whole bunch of stuff they don't want to do, banish a Resonator, and if they don't have a Resonator, they have to banish a stone, which really stinks, trust me. And then of course if they want to kill it, they have to banish something as well. And then Resonators uh, will just start to lose attack and defense, uh, especially if you have multiple runes revealed, that just becomes even bigger. And then you can also land an Astema as well, which Astema is very good. It's a 700 flyer um, that you can use to either draw a card or pay a bunch of life and make your opponent just be drained down to their last few points. Um, and that's pretty much the whole purpose of the deck. It uses Altar and Lila as well to ramp into this, uh, to ramp into a Heroic Epic or any of the other Resonators you might have in your hand. And of course it has the one Lorite to shut off your opponent's Altars. This deck is incredibly, incredibly important um, to look at because it, it just sort of tells you that even though Black, even though Altar and Lila are very powerful combos, it's not because they're powerful because um, you're able to do crazy stuff with them you're able to do crazy stuff in a multiple in a multitude of different ways that's why these cards are so powerful together so you're going to want to be watching out for that as we uh, head into the next format altar and lila is, is definitely a really potent combination of cards uh, but congratulations to paul for getting third place and next up we have grand rapids own uh, dan roland uh, Dan Roland is one of the coolest people I had on stream. He had some really insightful ideas for how to run this particular Loki deck. And as you'll notice, this is Loki Machines. Now, you, you know earlier that I said that Loki Machines is not really a thing. Like, you really want to be running, probably, uh, if you want to be running Perfect Loki, you're going to be wanting to uh, just mainboard that with a bunch of Perfect Lokis and some Fenrirs and just, just go for it. But Dan said, hey, why not? I'll just play Loki Machines and, you know, just casually get fourth place. Why not? At the Foul Festival. So this is a huge splash. And of course, he didn't ignore the fact that he could be playing Perfect Loki. He sideboarded it, which I think is such a cool idea. And then, of course, he has his Giants in the sideboard as well with his Neo Ragnarok in the rune deck. But if you're looking at the rune deck, you're going to be noticing this really different full art card. And what is that? It's Consume. Now, why Consume? Why not Return of God? Well, if you notice a lot of lists, Return of God and Mystery Box are not being used not nearly as much as they have been in the past. And Consume is really important because it gets something off the field. It's quick cast, 
And uh, in a meta like this one, where there was a bunch of Atom decks that we expected to be in the top, um, to be in the top cut, you know you're going to be seeing a lot of Zeus Alice. And you can look at, you know, really all of those different symbol skills right there in the middle of the card, and the thing you're not going to notice it's saying is this card gains barrier. It doesn't gain barrier. It gains everything else. It gains drain, eternal, it even gets a, a stat boost, a plus two, plus two. But consume kills it because you remove it from the game. And I'll even show you right there. Remove target resonator from the game. You gain life equal to its defense. You get the plus two, plus two. All of a sudden you're going up 10 life and they are out a Zeus Alice, which is kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah. Let's turn into the main deck now. So the things you're going to be noticing here are um, the Jormungandr, little eater of the world, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. I don't think we've seen this card nearly enough, but what's really nice about this is uh, you can remove a gluttony counter from this card, and if you do, you get to uh, remove a target resonator your opponent controls from the game. It's a little hard to read there, so if you can't read it, I don't blame you. You can find all of these on the Force of Will database, which is really nice. Um, but it gains some additional, eh, it gains some additional stats depending on what you want to do uh, to it. You can give it more counters if you really want to, but it's just a nice little way. One drop, it, it comes in with some counters, and you're able to sort of just remove some resonators from your opponent's side of the field. It's kind of nice. It's a nice little removal spell for a deck that doesn't really have good hard removal options outside of things like Camelot. Now, on stream, we were talking about how blue may not really have a lot of graveyard disruption, but I was very wrong, and of course, I'm very excited to be wrong, because it's a Shayla card. Shayla's Foresight. Now, Shayla's Foresight is kind of ridiculous. Now, I love Shayla's Foresight because I love Shayla. And you're going to love this card, too, because you're going to realize that even though we're losing this card in just a few days... Uh, you can put a target attacking Resonator on top of the owner's deck. Or you can do that to an addition. Or you can draw a card. Or, the most important effect, target player shuffles all Magic Stones from their graveyard into their Magic Stone deck. Then shuffles all other cards from their graveyard into their deck. This is very important. So... Blue actually has a way of interacting with the graveyard, which is incredibly important. Because all of the things happening in this meta revolve around the graveyard. And just having a couple copies is completely enough. Now, if you're in the situation where you have to recycle your own graveyard, you definitely can do that if you need to. But for the most part, it's going to be disrupting your opponent's graveyard that's really, really powerful. So congratulations to Dan Roland. This deck was exceptionally fun to watch um, and just watch him pilot it. He tested this clearly, extensively, and he knew what he was doing with it, and that's why he got fourth place. So congratulations to him. And then next up, we have the ninth place winner. Now, why are we, why are we covering ninth place? Well, because this particular deck got so much fanfare and was the only list of its kind in the entire Force of Will Festival that we had to cover it. In fact, it was so good that the chat was going crazy for it, and that is Dustin Jones' ninth place uh, Chimimi list. The only Chimimi list, remind you, it is the only one in the entire tournament. Now, how did he even get as far as he did? You know, like, I thought Chimimi was a dead deck, you might be saying. Well, Chimimi kind of is, but... Dustin Jones, darn near brought it back. Very, very, very close. And the main reason it's so good right now is because of a card that I think uh, I certainly overlooked, but maybe a lot of other people overlooked too, and that's Berserker Chimimi. So as long as your J-Roller is Chimimi, or Chimimi Guardian of the Sacred Bow, this card gains Eternal during your turn. So already, it's really, really, really hard to kill really hard to kill. So even if its defense hits zero, it doesn't die. So that's really nice. It'll always have 10 defense in your opponent's turn, and it doesn't matter what defense it has on your turn, because it'll never die. As long as your ruler's Chimimi. So just play this card with Chimimi. 
easy. Whenever another Mimi tribe you control is put into a graveyard from the field, recover this card. And of course, it has a plus three to attack fire breathing effect that it gets until end of the turn if you want to pay a bunch of red. And you're going to say, well, I have to kill my own Mimi tribes? Why would I ever do that? Well, let's just look at some of the Mimi tribes he has in the deck. There are about eight of them that he can use for the effect of Berserker Chimimi. And one of them is Acolyte of Shiva which makes all of your green stones into red stones, including uh, that fairy stone at the very, very, very bottom uh, next to the two basic wind stones. Sorry about that, I had a package delivered, but what I was talking about just, just a second ago, uh, the Acolyte of Shiva makes all of your wind stones into fire stones, and they all produce uh, fire. And you're gonna be noticing that there are a lot of fire stones at that point, because there's about 10 of them. But, also, uh, banish this card. Target J Resonator. Gains plus three, plus three until end of turn. So, we were looking at Berserker Chimimi. Whenever another Mimi tribe hits the graveyard, recover it. So you can effectively swing with this, banish this, and then you can pop this up even more if you need to. And then you can just wipe their entire board. And all of a sudden, this card is huge. And I mean, huge. Huge, 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 huge. And of course, if you're in the middle of an attack with this card and you say banish an Acolyte of Shiva to make this card's effect um, kick in, you basically will allow the damage to go through, recovering Berserker Chimimi so you can still attack in the same uh, battle step, which is really nice. So Acolyte of Shiva, very important card, but so is Eagle Me. So if you banish this card, you get plus four, plus four until end of turn. Now. This is obviously a Resonator, so you can get a plus four, plus four going on top of Berserker Chimimi, which is also really nice. So now all of a sudden you have a plus four, a plus three, on top of a 710 that can give itself plus three for just one Fire Will. It's a very, very good combo. And uh, I watched him do this on stream, and it was ridiculous. Uh, the fact that he could just bring it out with something like Verdant Garden of Ataractia, and just do ridiculous things with it. Give it flying with uh, Viola here as well. Uh, search it out with things like uh, Mike and all of these other ridiculous cards that, which by the way, are all going uh, away here pretty soon. The whole bottom uh, two rows as well as the Majin Dark Elves are all getting wrecked by the uh, by the ban hammer here pretty, uh, pretty quick. Um, just because of rotation. This deck is a work of art, and it's never going to be seen again. Um, so hopefully there's a, a rendition of it coming in uh, in future formats, because this deck is honestly really, really, really cool. It's very fun to watch. And honestly could do some of the most ridiculous things just because of... All because of this one card. This card brought a lot of things in the deck together, and uh, it just did some ridiculous things. And of course, he's able to run Athenia too, because why not? You're running Black Stones, Black Sources. So you might as well be playing one of the best cards in the entire game at the moment. So congratulations to Dustin Jones for almost getting there. You're very close, buddy, but yeah, you just didn't quite get there. Hopefully, at the next tournament, uh, you can make us love Chimimi for who she is and what she is. Because uh, she's just a great ruler, and it'd be cool if she actually cracked into the top eight with her new support. Congratulations, man. And finally, we have the Vite Ramen Circuit in Dallas. Now, there are only about nine people at this tournament, so I just figured I would cover the winner. Um, but this is the other Vite Ramen Circuit series that kicked off right before uh, the World Tournament happened. And I know that there are more happening as well. So um, some people are getting very, very excited for the Circuit Series. Uh, but the winner of Dallas was uh, Daniel Tran. Which, you know, this shouldn't look too different other than the Return of God that's in the main deck and in the, uh, in the Rune deck as well. Uh, you're able to sort of peel through your deck until you get to Athenia's, which is really nice, um, by turn three. So if you're able to peel one of these or a perfect Loki off the top of your deck, you're going to be doing some really great things. Or even an Astima or anything like that. And of course, you can protect your graveyard using Dark Alice, um, which is all very, very helpful. And uh, he's running three of the Chaos Stone, which allows you to uh, throw something into the graveyard if you need to. And he's playing the Sephiroth as well, so you're able to, uh, w with Altar, in, in addition to that, you're able to just dump everything you need into the graveyard. And, of course, get access to perfect mana, which is nice uh, if you want to just play things without having to worry about 
um, what your will are doing. So Daniel Tran got first place, and then of course his brother David Tran. Uh, I believe David Tran is your brother. Hopefully I'm not wrong about that, but they got second place with Ayu, which of course Ayu, it's really great. But why Ayu? Why now? There are all these singleton cards. Is there anything in here that's new? You might be wondering. And there is. I mean, there's, you know, March of the Dead. Uh, burial Rites as well uh, from this from this newest stuff. Erendite to match your, uh, to Keyes' call and stuff like that. It's all, you know, some of this stuff is, is really great. It's, it's fine. But the card that makes all the difference, that takes you from eight souls to nine, is Zeus Alice. And I love this card because it's actually a soul and I love that. It's hilarious to me that this card is actually a soul. So not only is Zeus Alice able to be played because you have access to it with things like uh, your possession stone giving you access to white, and then you have ac natural access to blue as well. Uh, Zeus Alice is just really nice to come in and, and play. You probably are more than likely going to be getting um, all of the different cards you need into the graveyard to play this with all of those crazy effects and uh, of course you have the shoal stone so you can just discard that to the graveyard to make it rain for no particular reason all so that you can activate Zeus Alice's effect this card's ridiculous I think this card's gonna be everywhere um, it's in Faria's colors so it's gonna be really great uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself I just want to say congratulations to Daniel and David Tran uh, for getting top two in their respective circuit series over in Dallas and of course now we get to move on to my thoughts um, so yeah before we get into our thoughts let's just keep in mind that we're getting new cards we're getting new cards very soon and by very soon I mean days days away very few days away uh, less than 14 closer than you could possibly imagine and some of those rulers are really good so let's talk about them so Leneth, the Priestess of El Savaria, Melgus, and Faria. Uh, Melgus and Faria, of course, are returning uh, from their time uh, that we had them in the original Alice Cluster. Now this is, not to be confused, with Alice Origins. Uh, Alice 1, as we might call it, Alice 1 uh, brought out uh, these seven kings to, uh, to the game, and they had this particular... Uh, gimmick to them in that they got effects based on their regalia. Now we have Leneth, and she's a new character to us, although she seems to be pretty important in connecting uh, the realm of Valhalla to the realm of uh, Ataractia. But as, as you can see, there's a lot of different effects going on with these cards. Uh, they have God's Arts, they have front sides that do effects when regalia come into the field. Uh, they interact with this thing called the Stranger Deck. There's a lot of stuff going on with these rulers. And I just wanted to get into uh, the basics here. So their regalia are uh, Caduceus, Leviton, and Excalibur. And if you can tell by Excalibur, we're getting knights. And knights are going to be super fun. Um, but what you're also going to notice here is that there are some prominent colors that are being displayed in the first set. So we're getting blue, we're getting white, we're getting red, and we're getting black. A little bit of black, uh, thanks to Melgus. And uh, that's a lot of colors, right? So we're just getting a little bit of black, a little bit of an introduction. And as we've been saying all video long, black is probably the best color in Force of Will. Um, so Melgus, yeah, he's got a good foot right in front of him but I would also say that uh, white is not far behind and of course red got a huge jump in this set as well and uh, blue is not exactly the worst color in force of will anymore it's got some very potent and very powerful cards uh, especially in its own archetype machines and Loki have been very very good so I'm not gonna count blue out either but you're also gonna notice that there is no green in this set at all so if you go to the spoiler list on the Force of Will da uh, database, um, altervista.net or .com, I'm not really sure which one it is, but that is there. Force of Will database, fan run database. If you check the spoilers, there are no green cards revealed. So high probability at this point that there is no green in the set. But people are kind of freaking out about these regalia. 
So you're going to see the mythic keyword here for these two regalia. So that means there's no doubling up. There's no double Excalibur, triple Excalibur, uh, 15 Leviton on the field at any given time. Um, they still give your uh, your J Ruler additional effects. Leviton gives your J Ruler swiftness. Excalibur gives your J Ruler plus four plus four. Arguably, it's a little bit worse. They also can you know produce will that allow you to play strangers or um, any of the particular arts that are corresponding to your particular ruler. And then of course um, you can use them to play God's arts as well, which is I think a really cool idea. Uh, Val 2 from way back in Alice 1, um, that cluster, um, that was great. I think that was just, a, she's just going to love these cards. It's going to be great. We're going to see a, a new resurgence of Val 2 in Wander. It's going to be awesome. But we should also mention that these cards, these regalia, are not their former versions. This Leviton is not this Leviton. This Leviton is not this Leviton. These cards are not these cards. These cards are broken. These cards are balanced. These cards, well, the left one is banned. Like, it is it is straight up gone. Not only does it give your J-Ruler swiftness, it allowed you to give your J-Ruler imperishable, and you could tap it and untap it, and you could banish to recover the card, and you could, oh my god, you could dump a whole bunch of them to produce will so like we're still in flavor text but it's not nearly as ridiculous and of course the biggest thing that you have to notice about these cards the reason they're so broken is that they are zero cost so these cards oh no they have they have will costs and uh, they, they have costs that are kind of difficult to get to unless you have dual stones which by the way hey we're getting dual stones by the way um, these cards are going to be a little bit harder to play because they're two drops these are not two drops. Um, so I'm really glad that they rebalanced these. Now that's going to change the dynamic of the game a lot. And we're going to have to play Regalia differently. So there's the Mythic keyword and there's the Will restriction, making these cards a little bit more um, hefty when you put them into the field. They actually have particular effects. So folks who are looking at these and saying, oh no, here it goes. Alice won all over again. We're going to be seeing some crazy things. I just want us all to relax. Because if you're looking at these cards the way I'm looking at these cards, objectively, from the point of view that we're seeing right now, uh, these cards do not do crazy things like their forebears did. So that's the first and most important thing. The next most important thing to recognize about this cluster so far is that these were some of the most broken cards ever printed in Alice 1. In Alice 1. Now, we're going to be going over why these these things are probably not as good as you think they're going to be. They're good. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're good cards. You're going to want to play them in your decks. But there's some stuff being different uh, around them. Now, you're going to say, well, what about Alter? So you even mentioned Alter in this video. Alter and Rook Egg. Guinevere and Rook Egg. Uh, alter and everything. Um, yeah, isn't Melgus going to be really good? And that's true. I think Melgus is going to potentially run at least two to three Sacrificial Altar, maybe even four, a full playset. They might even run Layla, and they may not even play red at all. That's true. That's very possible. And it's true. You can sacrifice Altar um, to get anything else out of the deck you need. And you can use Rook Egg as part of that. So you can either run Lila or Rook Egg. That is very true. You can tutor things out of your deck. You can um, do whatever you want to do. It's going to be intensely consistent. I agree. But I think we need to recognize that you may not want to do that for every deck you make. For every deck you make, right? So you could play four Scorched Bales. And you could play a bunch of basic stones. Now all of a sudden your deck can't be as in red. So why play Rook Egg at all? Right, so you're gonna be playing Lila, Rook Egg, Altar. All of a sudden, that's 12 cards out of your 40 that you're allowed to have. That's a lot. So you're gonna be wanting to play probably less Rook Eggs because Lila, at the end of the day, it gets you a stone, and Rook Egg just gets you a resonator. And stones are better because they let you play bigger resonators, or more resonators, or more spells, or more altars, or whatever you want. Stones are infinitely more reusable than resonators are. So that's a thing. So counting on the fact that Rook Egg only gets you resonators and Lila gets you stones, 
And if you're playing Lila to get stones, you're probably not playing as many red stones. Ruki doesn't look that great. And if you're playing Ruki and Guinevere together, you're probably going to be wanting to run mostly red. So you could play Alter, which is fine. And if you want to play Ruki and Alter together, that's fine. But you're not going to be using Alter with Ruki like you would Alter with Lila. It's going to be a different way to play the card and a different way to use the card. So I'm just going to keep that in mind. That's my opinion on this interaction. And you could definitely have a different opinion. And if you want to express that, be nice, but put it down in the comment section down below. I want to, I just want to have a discussion about this interaction. I think it's going to be very important. But of course, the other Resonator we haven't talked about yet, quite yet, is Lancelot. Now, when this card was being released, people were kind of freaking out because it's Lancelot. Lancelot, who had Necromancy of the Undead Lord back in Alice 1, when you got to put this thing on the field and immediately from the graveyard equip all of these Necromancy of the Undead Lord to it, giving a plus two, plus two for each copy. If you had at least two copies, or if you even had one copy, you could do some ridiculous stuff with it, and we'll explain why. Of course, if you wanted to save your Lancelot, you had Apollo, so you could just put it right back into your hand. And again, this is a zero cost regalia, so just keep that in mind as well. We are probably never gonna get this card in quite the same way ever again. This card is never gonna be reprinted in the way that it is right now. It's even banned in Wanderer because it's so good. But at the time Lancelot was initially released, you could run four of these and four Necromancy. But we also had a different ruler. Now some of you might have heard of this infamous ruler because some people believe that it was pushing the game into a territory where it was going to die very quickly. And that's Reflect Refrain. Now clearly, we banned this card at the right time, and we got ahead of it enough that the game is still alive, right? We're going back to Alice Cluster. The game didn't end in Alice Cluster. Um, but Reflect Refrain is a ruler. And of course, on the front side, it had a bunch of effects that you could do for free. So a bunch of free effects are probably not good for the game, right? And you could give something plus two, plus two if you wanted to. So Lancelot plus Necromancy plus a reflect effect to give it plus two plus two gave it the thousand that you needed to start activating its burn effect for 700 damage and of course if something happened to Lancelot like it was being targeted with a spell that would kill it in some way well you could just pop it right back into your hand with Apollo Necromancy would go to the graveyard and then of course you could just play that Lancelot one more time and of course with Lan uh, with a uh, with all of these things so of course you had uh, Rook Egg to tutor out Lancelot or tutor out your Guinevere. You could use your Guinevere to discard your Necromancy to the graveyard. You could search for your Apollos. It was internally consistent like no one has ever seen in the history of this game. And none of these cards are printed. But there was one more card we should probably talk about and that is Little Red the Pure Stone. You call Red when it enters the field and you can give that Resonator with that same attribute plus two plus two into the end of the turn. You could plump up Lancelot to now Lancelot is this huge resonator with necromancies, uh, with a reflect effect on it, with Apollo, able to put it back in your hand and save it from destruction. None of these cards exist except for Lancelot. So all these cards no longer exist except for Lancelot. And Gawain. And New Percival. And Hector. And of course, you can use Guinevere's effect to give him plus four, plus four if you want. You can do that. But these cards have a cost, right? They are they are within the realm of tempo. So yes, you can search out your Lancelot very easily. You can search out your Guinevere's very easily. You can pump them up with Gwains, multiple Gwains. You can play a Hector for one and all of a sudden your Lancelot has enough going for it. This is the way that Lancelot used to be played way back in SKL when you weren't playing something like Baja Blast. If you were just playing regular, regular knights and you played Lancelot, this is how you got Lancelot to the effect um, of, a, of 1000 attack to do the burn effect. It was a slow, it was a mid-range game and that's how we're introducing Lancelot again. You notice None of those cards before that I mentioned, none of those cards are being reprinted. None of those cards are in the game. 
Now, there are some tools that we already have, like Power of Immortality, right? So you can pump up your lance a lot, you can swing, and if it dies, well, you can bring it right back. That is something you can do. And that's one will, and that's only in lists that have access to black. Which admittedly is a few, but then again you have to be running a lot of red cards to play Lance a lot too, because he's too red. So you might be playing him in a Chmimi list with things like Eagle Me to get him to where, you know, you can swing with your Lance a lot after you swung with your Eagle Me. That's a thing you can do. That's real. You can also do the same thing with Acolyte and Berserker Chmimi. Uh, you can do it with Avalon as well. We have these new card. We have this new card coming out. I completely forgot about it, so I threw it in at the last moment. But these cards do exist. Um, and they are able to interact with Lancelot, and they are able to get Lancelot to the point where Lancelot can use the effect to burn. 700 is not like it was, though, right? So, Power of Immortality, March of the Dead. We have Resonators with Barrier. We have tons of removal as well. We have Severing Life Blade. So you burn something for 700, you just kill the Lancelot in response to the burn, right? You, you let something die, the target dies, Life Severing Blade comes in and kills the Lancelot, and sure, that's a thing, um, and you can bring that Lancelot back relatively easily. But, hey, I think that means that Lancelot is a powerful card, but it's not oppressive. But let's just talk for a minute about what these two cards can really do for the game. I want to shift the conversation. I don't want to talk about these cards as if they are the, the bane of Force of Will's existence. They are going to destroy this game. They are going to make everything terrible. I don't want to talk about, like... I just don't want to do that anymore, right? Rook Egg, Guinevere, Lancelot, I think they're going to be very good for the game. These two cards specifically, because I've already talked a lot about Lancelot, but I want to get into how these cards can actually benefit a ruler that has no love. And yes, I'm going there. Fushi. So let's talk about Fushi a little bit. Fushi is not good. Fushi does not have consistency. Fushi is hard to play. Fushi has a large deactivate cost, but Fushi has support. What Fushi does not have is consistency, or draw power, or ways to get things out of your hand that you don't need, or ways to interact with other colors in a meaningful way. But Fushi does have Lady Huang, who is really good if you're able to get out your dragon emblems and, and do a bunch of cool things with her. But if you don't need her in your hand, all of a sudden she's a dead card. Hey, let's pitch her to Guinevere. I think that's a really great idea. Get her out of your hand and plus you can run like two copies in your deck now because you can just tutor out Rook Egg. Great. Perfect. Also, we have things like Lord of Vermilion, which are really hard to get into your hand if you don't have them already. But more importantly, you want to get Lord of Vermilion into your hand after you play, uh, well, not this card, but this card. <laughs> well, you want to play Genshi Tencho first. So when Lord of Vermilion comes in, you're able to get all the emblems that you want. And then, of course, we have the mini water dragon here as well. Um, you want him in your hand, and you want him on the field, so you actually get access to the colors you need to play Genshi. So that's a thing. And now you have ways of finding that card. You're able to tutor it with Rook Egg. You're able to get all your combo pieces together. Fushi is very much a combo ruler, but all the things that Fushi needs in order to get going are very hard to access. So what about things that you know you want in hand, but you can't really necessarily get? Well, what about Wrath of the Flame God? You can't tutor this. You can only draw for it. Guinevere helps you do that. Then, of course, you have the other Master Rune from Fushi, the, the Three Kingdom Patrician Plan, which is sort of like a mini Excalibur for Fushi, and uh, it's just a two-drop, get rid of stuff in your opponent's side of the field, right? So if you're able to play, like, three or four copies of this and get them into hand, uh, Guinevere can actually help you make that happen, right? She can actually allow you to play this card. And, of course, Wrath of the Flame God only gets cheaper for every Flame Emblem you control, which is really nice. And then if you need to run this as well, you can. You can run Surtur, and you can tutor it right into your hand with Guinevere or Rook Egg. You know, whatever helps you get there first. Or you can even tutor your Ushua in the hand. All right, isn't that great? I mean, all of a sudden you, you can play these big resonators in a way that's consistent. You can run like one or two Surtur. Or you can run one Ushua 
Isn't that fun? And of course, the new support is Drag. You can also run Drag in this list now. If you want to go with Fushi into black, blue, red shenanigans and run Drag, you can. You can flip Fushi. You can get um, any of your dragons. And then you can sacrifice stuff to make Drag easier to play and play Drag. Or, if you want to flip Fushi and get a dragon from your deck, you can just get the new Blazer, who, yes, is a dragon. It's a 10 ton flying dragon. Isn't that ridiculous? Also, you can tutor it with a Rook Egg. So now, uh, you, it enters the field, target J resonator your opponent controls, loses all abilities on the end of the turn, and it is destroyed. It is not, it's not just astral, it's really astral. Your, your ruler, the ruler your opponent controls, loses all abilities until the end of the game. It loses everything. So this card's a threat. This card is actually worth making Fushi go into three colors, in my opinion. This card is really good, and you can do that very easily with Scorch Bales, and you can make it so that, uh, of course, your your little baby dragon makes Scorch Bales a three mana, produce whatever you want sort of stone. It doesn't have to be just, you know, produce black or red. It can also produce blue now, because it's technically a fire magic stone. So there's a lot of different things that these particular cards can bring to the game. And I just want to continue to have the conversation in such a way that these cards are actually adding something to the game, not threatening the game. They're bringing new strategies to the game, they're bringing more fun and nostalgia to the game, they're not bringing oppression and um, centrality to red by being in the game. Okay? Now, of course, you're able to disagree with me. All of you are. You can definitely do that. But be nice in the comment section down below. You can definitely do that. And just let me know if you agree with me or disagree with me. All of these things we can have a conversation with. So just put them down in the comment section down below. I'll be looking forward to it. And of course, we have one final question for the entire video. Thank you for sticking around with me, by the way. This has been a very long video, but it's a, it's a roundup. So let's end on this question. What are your predictions for the metagame? when uh, Alice Origins won the set, the first set, lands. I'm very interested in what you have to say. I think it's gonna be very wide. I think it's gonna be crazy. Uh, because not only did Decisive Battle of Valhalla just sort of break all of my expectations for what this game can do, it went even further beyond that. Especially when I start looking at this, this new support for Alice Cluster, I'm very excited. And of course, I think it's a new age for Wanderer as well. So I think Wanderer is gonna be a very different format, especially now that we have the uh, the Wanderer committee doing a lot of different things. And uh, with this new stuff coming into the game, I think we're just gonna to continue to see really interesting and very innovative decks that are able to do a, a lot of different things in this, uh, in this entire um, metagame, this entire game we call Force of Will. I love it. I think Fushi might actually be a deck. I don't know if it's going to be a very good deck, but it's going to be a deck, and I'm very excited to see that. Let me know what you guys are excited for down in the comment section down below. If you agree or disagree, you have a nuance point you want to say, of course, always be nice. Put it down in the comment section down below. It's been way too long. I'm excited to see what, what tournaments come out of the next uh, A1 set, A01 set here, A02 potentially as well. And uh, guys... It's been real. I'm really excited to see what happens with Force of Will. I'll catch you guys later. And until next time, this has been Paul, signing off.